OK, I'll start just by briefly introducing myself. So my name is Tamara and I run the water conservation program for the city of Flagstaff. And we wanted to host this little webinar and invite Stephanie from the EPA to come talk because we do a lot of public outreach uh, here in Flagstaff to residents and to commercial businesses. And in conversations that we have with uh, residents and businesses, we often hear express that they hire a plumber to do some work and that the information that's communicated to them is that efficient products, so like a water efficient toilet or shower head that um, a plumber has had a bad experience in the past and that they aren't uh, sure that those items are going to work well for their customers. And so since we hear messages like that and we've had experiences like that, we thought that it would be helpful to chat with somebody from the EPA that runs the water sense program because their program is essentially supposed to do a uh, review of these products to ensure that they don't only save water, but that they actually work well, that you're not going to buy a dud. Um, and so that's why we invited Stephanie to chat with us today. So Stephanie Tanner is the lead engineer for the U.S. Environmental, uh, the EPA's Water Sense program. She's responsible for all the technical aspects of the development of the labeled products, including setting efficiency and performance criteria, as well as managing the certification process. And prior to her work at the EPA, she managed a water efficiency program for federal facilities and wrote several guides to water efficiency for federal facilities. And she's really a, a great resource and an expert in this field. And I think that she is really gonna be able to provide us with some really good information. So Stephanie is gonna go over that information with us. And then at the end, we have um, a little message from part of our team that does work uh, in industrial compliance. They just wanted to, to give a short message too. And we also have Niagara here to talk a little bit about the stealth. Uh, we are offering a free stealth toilet for all the plumbers and suppliers that attend this, uh, this workshop. So I'm gonna start off by just handing it off to Stephanie so that we can hear about okay. some of these technical aspects. Okay, well, thank you Tamara for inviting me to come today. Um, I'm going to start to share my screen. So give me a moment here. Uh, OK, so uh, I hope everybody can see the presentation. Um, so um, so today what I was going to talk about is basically what Tamara asked me to talk about, which was our how we develop our specifications, a little bit about the water sense program. Um, we have uh, specifications for five plumbing products that I'll talk about, um, mostly spending time on toilets and shower heads because those are the ones where I think there's the most concern. Um, and then we also have some other products uh, for irrigation that often plumbers install, but not always. And I thought I'd just mention those. And then there, I think there's time for some Q&A and I have a few videos to show you of how the testing is done. So WaterSense is a voluntary program uh, for uh, launched by the EPA in 2006. And we basically just try to provide a simple way for consumers to identify a water efficient, high performing product. Uh, we also label uh, some programs for irrigation installers, and then we also have a label for new homes. Um, but all of our products that bear the WaterSense label, which you can see here on the uh, right hand side of the screen, are independently tested and certified for efficiency and performance. So the label, you know, is backed by the credibility of the EPA. Um, all our the testing and certification is done by independent organizations that typically already certify these products. So like CSA, um, IATMO, those kinds of organizations that um, the plumbing community is very familiar with. They're the ones that certify our products um, and they do it in conjunction with their certification for the Uniform Plumbing Code and ASME A CSA standards. Um, and like I said, the, the label is just something that it's easy for consumers to understand and um, and we use our resources more effectively that way because we have um, all of these other people sort of involved in the process 
and helping to make sure that the label stays credible and um, and making sure that it stays uh, it's properly used. So when we set out to label a product, we um, we take you know requests from the public, uh, from manufacturers sometimes to like look at certain product categories. Um, then we do our own research on things that are uh, newly available or uh, coming into the marketplace. And, um, and so we look at sort of these factors to determine which products we're gonna start to try to label. So we look for um, uh, equivalent or superior performance to conventional models. We look for water efficiency that's at least 20% uh, more efficient than conventional models. We want products that can be used nationwide, where the results, the savings can be measured, um, where there's, you know, our requirements can't be proprietary in any way. So we want to make sure there's multiple ways to achieve the criteria, to meet the criteria, and that a product can be differentiated by the label, and then it can also be independently tested and certified. So the process can take, uh, I think the fastest we've ever gone is about two years from concept to labeled product. And the longest was 14 uh, for an irrigation product that had no testing uh, regime set up and had, a, and had sort of a different process with industry to get to. Um, but usually it's about two years. Um, and what we do is we do our own research when we get ideas or suggestions in from, um, you know, the public, we do our own research. We look at all the products that are currently being produced. WaterSense is not a sort of leading edge standard. We are looking for products that are already in production um, that need some sort of push to get more widely adopted by consumers. Um, so we look at the availability of performance standards uh, that exist on water efficiency and potential and performance. And then we look for whether there's a lot of support from our whole stakeholder community, meaning retailers and distributors, manufacturers, the public water utilities, wastewater utilities. Um, we're, we're looking for all of that kind of support to help you know, move this product forward. Once we feel like we have all of those things in place, then we would issue something called a notice of intent, which is basically us going out in public and saying, this is what we're planning to do. This is how we see the product, you know, where we see product performance criteria being, you know, sort of what areas we might want to set performance standards for, how we would set the efficiency standards, what tests or standards we're going to use, um, and then any other criteria we might add in there and how we would label that product and sort of what our general timeline for that would be. And if there's a need for doing more research, like let's say a test method doesn't exist, then we would like allow time for you know finding a standards committee to work with to develop that test method and um, and sort of work through that process with them. Once we've established all of those things and we've sort of answered all of the questions that need to be answered, then we would publish a draft specification. The public is invited to comment again. They can comment on the notice of intent as well. Um, and they have a you know a 45 to 60 day comment period where they can you know, give us additional information or comment, but the draft specification basically says, this is what we propose to have as the water efficiency and performance criteria. This is the test method we're gonna use. This is the standard that's gonna be required uh, for the product to meet. This is how it would get labeled. And um, this is how, you know, anything you have to do to sort of like package and label it, any information you have to put on the package for consumers to understand what they're buying. Um, people comment on that. If necessary, but rarely so, we it will issue a second draft if we have to make a major change to the test method. And then, you know, we issue a final specification once we sort of nail down all the comments and questions that we've had. Um, and, um, and then we also set up the third party infrastructure. So we would send the, you know, a preliminary final specification to the certifying bodies. They would uh, decide that they're going to certify these products. They would send us, uh, you know, uh, a sort of an application that says that they're competent to do that testing. They already have done it, or they've participated in training that we offer for test methods that are newly developed as part of the process. Um, and then, you know, they can start labeling products. And usually it takes about, 30 days to three months before you see product, you know, after the final spec is published, before you start to see labeled products uh, showing up on our, on our list. 
So uh, I talked a little bit about this, but we work a lot with standards organizations. We find that it gives us a lot of access to experts in the technology. We get a lot of experts in testing. We get a lot of experts from utilities and uh, from consumers and environmental organizations, and it helps us to develop a test and a sort of a test method in particular that uh, industry can really get behind that makes sense for what we're trying to do with the product and that is um, cost effective for manufacturers to perform and that can be done uh, repeatedly by lots of different organizations so that when a manufacturer goes to, to test lab A um, that they'll get the same result as if someone who goes to test lab B. So we make sure that we do a lot of that round robin testing to make sure that the results are repeatable and everybody understands what needs to happen. So once we've sort of done all that and the product is, the specification is ready, we have a certification system that sort of defines who can participate in the process from in the certification of products. And we have criteria for accreditation bodies, for certification bodies, for manufacturers, um, so that everybody understands what the process is to get the label on the product. And so an accreditation body will make sure that the certifying bodies are competent to do the testing, that they've taken the training that they need to have, or they already have been doing this testing. They also make sure that manufacturers have, um, you know, that they inspect their manufacturing facility so that if you're a manufacturer, you want to make this product and we give you the label that you are capable of continuously producing a quality product, right, that you have quality procedures in place so that that's going to work, um, that they can issue the label to all the manufacturers that they're going to come to them and that they can do ongoing surveillance of the product. So once the product is certified, it has two years in the marketplace and then it has to it has to it becomes eligible for recertification, which means that the certifying body is going to randomly select products that have already been certified and then retest them to make sure they continue to meet the criteria and that changes in manufacturing haven't altered the performance of those products. So, um, and then the other thing is the certifying bodies have to be available where the products are manufactured. So we have certifying bodies with offices and test facilities all over the globe. They can test products wherever they're made and, um, and, and WaterSense products come from all over the globe. They are made in now, anywhere plumbing products are made, you have a WaterSense label product made there, and we have a lot of foreign manufacturers, and all of those products are tested by our certifying bodies to the WaterSense specifications, you know, before they come to the United States. So, um, I mean, it, I can't, with the screen up, I can't really ask questions, but I'm happy to take questions anytime anybody wants to ask a question. I don't know. I guess you can unmute yourself and ask me, but feel free to just jump in and ask a question. Um, so the first specification we issued was for tank type toilets. Um, I think it's the product that most people had the most concerns about. There was a lot of dissatisfaction with, uh, with toilets after the Energy Policy Act of 1992. Um, and uh, the DOE requirements for 1.6 gallons per flush uh, kind of caught manufacturers to some extent off, you know, off, you know, guard and uh, they, you know, they weren't ready for the reduced flush volumes in the design of their toilets. But our specification is applicable to all kinds of tank type toilets, uh, both single and dual flush. Our maximum flush volume is 1.28 gallons. Uh, dual flush toilets have uh, calculate that by an average of two reduced and one full flush. So you will have water sense toilets that have a 1.6 gallon per flush maximum, but that those are only on dual flush toilets. Um, all of the toilets that are water sense eligible have to pass the ASME CSA 19.2 standard first. Um, and over time that test method has included the water sense test method, which is the 350 grams of soybean media and four bowls of toilet paper. But it also includes the drain line carry, surface wash down, granule and ball test. Those were always part of the standard and those are all also required as part of water sense. Like I said, you know, the specification was really developed because of the poor performance of low flow toilets in the, in the early 90s. 
Um, but what happened was is after the first few years, manufacturers really spent a lot of time re-engineering their toilets. They hired a lot of PhDs in fluids. They hired a lot of engineers. They really spent time figuring out how to make their toilets better, but they couldn't convince the public of that. And um, utilities were spending a lot of time and effort coming up with their own lists of what toilets worked and what didn't, and that was very expensive. And then, you know, each city or state would have a different set of requirements and a different list, and manufacturers were finding that very hard to navigate. You know, they didn't want it. They wanted to be able to sell the same toilet in San Francisco as they sold in, in Dallas and in Seattle, and they wanted to make sure that there was one uh specification for that. And so that's sort of where WaterSense came in. We worked with our stakeholders uh, to develop meaningful performance criteria. And so that's how we settled on the 350 grams of soybean waste. Um, you know, uh, toilet manufacturers had worked uh, to develop that. There was a test called the maximum performance test that was starting to be used. Um, and, you know, uh, that would test toilets and it would measure uh, when the toilet failed to flush and you would get a score based on how much media you could flush before failure. And um, but now this test is limited to a thousand grams of, of media. But we also looked at how the toilets performed in terms of drain line transport um, and making sure they could flush uh, and that the waste would move down the drain line. So I'm gonna just go through a couple of videos of our toilet testing. So this is just sort of the setup. Um, um, and they have this jig that goes over the toilet and then all the waste is dropped through the little hole um, just so that it, they're all sort of tested in the same way. And um, so uh, the first test is gonna be the, one of the people who invented the map test uh, showing you a test with 500 grams. Uh, then and comparing two toilets, one that did clear the waste and one that didn't. And then the second video is going to be just the water sense test and showing how, you know, basically just how that's conducted. So uh, here we go. How important is map testing? Well, let me put it to you this way. Both of these toilets are certified and approved for sale in Canada and the USA. Both toilet bowls are filled with 500 grams of toilet test media, but the toilet on the left has passed map testing and the toilet on the right has failed map testing. You decide which toilet you would like to buy. Okay, so this one is just the mat is just the water sense test method. So this video, the image is a little skewed so that it wasn't so narrow. Um, I hope you can see it better, but it's basically the same test, but it has you can see the um, the you know each of these uh, media samples is. 50 grams, and so water sense requires 350, so there's seven, and then four balls of crumpled toilet paper. And the, you know, they catch the waste at the bottom of the bowl to make sure at the outflow of the toilet to make sure that it's everything has come out that went in. And so that's basically how the test is done. So um, you'll notice that the the waste is encased in a you know a plastic uh, sleeve, and that's because um, the soybean media when you flush it once it dis it disintegrates and it was you know it's it's very expensive and um, all of that waste has to sort of be managed and it has a very high like environmental impact and so. After a few years, we well, when the specification first came out, we required that the waste wasn't encased. 
Um, and then over time and with lots of other testing, we realized that there was no difference in performance, whether you use the encased media or the unencased media. And so it was just a lot cheaper and more cost effective for manufacturers if we could use the cased media. So they petitioned us to say, could we make that switch? And we did. Um, the other thing is, is we, you know, like with MAP, we list, we limit ours to 350, MAP limits theirs to 1,000 because this waste sinks pretty heavily in the toilet. And as you know, like there's a lot of things that float that go into a toilet and we wanted to make sure that the toilets could, you know, weren't so heavily weighted towards design for sinking media that they could flush, still flush all kinds of other things that are used and uh, that are placed into a toilet. So this is a, I think a really great um, graph that the people that do the maximum performance test or the MAP test uh, created. And it shows the improvement in flush performance over time. And they've tested thousands of models of toilets between when they started in 2003 and even today they continue to do that. And you can see that the average MAP score was very low, um, you know, uh, in 2003. But it was still, you know, just around the water sense level by the, at that point in time, and that's when we started coming into the into the picture. But they hadn't really tested very many toilets, only about 40. Um, but over time, you know, with the MAP score becoming more and more important to water sense and to utilities, the scores really improved. And so now the average is is probably a little over 800, almost 900. You know, they don't test anything over a thousand grams anymore. But, you know, there's thousands of toilets now that have gone through this process. Thousands of them have passed and thousands of them have proved that they can they can flush up to a thousand grams of waste. And so the average is 800. So, you know, it's 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 just, you know, it, there's just a high level of confidence out there in the industry now. In addition, um, a few years ago, well, two years ago, we were asked to look at customer satisfaction with water sense uh, products. And, you know, we don't have a lot of direct feedback from um, customers because most people go either straight to their um, to their plumber who installed it or they go to the manufacturer of the toilet or to the utility program that paid for the installation. Um, and that's where they sort of provide their feedback, although we do get some feedback on our Watersons helpline. But the utilities that have had direct install programs have all said that, you know, for the most part, they have very high ratings. People are very satisfied with their toilets that they've installed and um, and that they they don't really report serious clogging problems. And if they do, they're usually sometimes related to something else. Um, there was another study done by a plumbing research commission, which I'll talk about when I get to flushometer valve toilets that found that it was really the toilet paper that sort of made the difference in like drain line clogging, not sort of like clearance out of the bowl, but in like what sort of clogged your drain line further on. Um, so people have been very satisfied with their toilets. We get very few comments from uh, the public on our helpline. And when we ask manufacturers about their feedback, they don't give us the data, but they have said pretty much uniformly that menu that Customers are pretty happy with the labeled toilets and they have if they have complaints, they're about the unlabeled products. So um, our specification for flush valve toilets is similar to the tank type toilets, the same uh, maximum uh, flush volume of 1.28, but that applies to both single and dual flush toilets. And um, we did that. Um, you know, we just felt like we wanted to keep them the same, um, you know, as, as much as possible. The only difference with this specification is that um, there's a minimum flush volume on it, and that's one one gallon per flush. And um, we did that because there's uh, the drain lines in commercial buildings can be much longer than they are in uh, residential buildings. And so there was some concern that there would be more clogging uh, if you didn't have just a minimum amount of water that always went through the toilet. Um, the test rig that this Plumbing and Ener Industry Research Council used um, found that after like below one gallon per flush, there was a lot of chaotic flow and that didn't happen above one gallon per flush as the minimum. So it's 1.28 the max and so like the 1.28 for the minimum flush volume. 
So um, the next product is shower heads. Uh, I think most people have seen the the you know the Seinfeld episode where Kramer has the terrible shower, the terrible experience with his low flow shower head. So what we were trying to do with this shout with this product was, you know, it's very hard to determine what is a perfect shower because everybody enjoys different things in the shower. And if you spend any time reading Amazon reviews like I do of shower heads, you'll see that there'll be a shower head that people say they give it five stars because it has a really strong, powerful uh, flow or you know, force to it. And then people will give it one star because it has a strong, powerful flush flow and they don't like that. So, you know, it's sort of, a, there's a lot of sort of personal, um, you know, opinion about what constitutes a good shower. But what we did was we had a number of manufacturers uh, submit anonymously shower heads that they knew had had a lot of complaints um, from, you know, consumers and they submitted those to us and we tested those to see what it was that people didn't like about it. And we measured the force, the coverage, the temperature drop on those showers and all of those things. And then we, co we correlated that with customer satisfaction ratings. And then we had people shower in all of those and tell us what they thought about that. And what we found was that what people were looking for is to be able to make sure that they're gonna get a consistent flow no matter what pressure they have in their house and that um, it's gonna provide a certain amount of coverage and um, and then the force is gonna be at a minimum level, right? Like they, they will be satisfied if there's a minimum amount of force. And so we figured all of that out through testing. And what that was is, um, you know, that there had to be about two ounces of force and I'll show you how we test for that. And then the coverage is basically in a, and I'll show you the gauge that we use for that, but it basically avoids having what's called a hollow spot where you have a lot of water flow around the outside, but nothing in the inside, or you have like a very narrow beam drilling into you from, you know, and there's no water on the outside. It's just like a very narrow beam. So we try to avoid that. And that's basically what the test methods uh, look for. And then they also look for basically pressure compensation for the shower head. So we don't require pressure compensation, but the way the requirements are set up, the performance requirements are set up, you have to have about 60% of the maximum flow rate at 20 PSI. And um, so that you, you know, you're still getting some flow. Then we also have a flow rate that's measured at 45 PSI so that plumbers or people who are installing it can match that to the shower valve and make sure that the shower valve is providing sufficient protection from uh, thermal shock and scalding because now you can match the flow rate for the shower to the flow rate for the shower valve and uh, make sure that you're not, people aren't getting scalded in the shower. So this is the, you know, this shows both tests sort of in schematic view um, and it, you know, the shower head is set up in the, on the spray force test. There's a balance beam and that's weighted with two ounces as a counterbalance. And then it has to move that uh, apparatus through the zero mark in order to, to show that it has at least two ounces of force on, the, on that force plate. And then we just have a, a device with a lot of concentric rings on it that um, captures the water and measures how much water is flowing into each ring. And that, you know, and that's how we sort of do the, uh, the shower test. So here's uh, Moen sent us these, and this you can see on the two slides on the left, how the shower head is set up on the rig. And then you can see the rig in function on the next slide to the left. And then you can see this, the third slide from the left is the, the annular ring gauge. And um, and then all of those rings have tubes that come out of them, and then the water is measured as it comes off of those, and the shower is mounted directly above that, and um, and then you can you can just sort of it runs for a certain amount of time, and then you calculate how much water has flown into each of those. Um, when the specification first came out, we didn't allow rain showers, and those are the ones that are mounted directly overhead. Um, because manufacturers wanted those sort of kept separate, but, um, and they weren't very popular, but now they're much more popular. And so we uh, had to readjust the math for the test so that you can mount a rain shower vertically above the gauge. And we sort of, 
recalculate the number based on geometry, fr frankly, um, to make sure that they can still be tested for the spray force. So this is a video um, of the spray force testing. All right, let's talk about shower head testing. With shower head testing, we're interested to know what the performance of the shower head is and how the consumer will react to that. So one of the things consumers are interested in is how much shower force does your shower head have? So we'll set the shower head up in this fixture and we'll spray the water down onto this tilt mechanism. And based on how much this, this um, target will tilt, we can understand how much shower force is being applied to the consumer. So we want good shower force because we wanna be able to rinse our hair out uh, um, with soap. We want to be able to get a good massaging feature maybe on our body so we get a nice relaxing shower head. So um, different shower heads can produce different shower force. The next thing that we're always interested in is how much water flows out of the shower head. So we don't want to use too much uh, water. We're very interested to design a shower head that is what I call EPA friendly. So uh, we are not wasting too much uh, shower or too much water, but giving us good performance. So we'll measure water flow. And then the next thing we look at is water distribution. So uh, this device, this patternator here, um, we'll set a shower head up here and we'll spray the water down into the patternator and it has all these different rings to give us resolution on how wide or narrow the shower is. So we'll collect the water up into these tubes. We'll make measurements of the water tubes, and then we can tell whether we have a narrow shower or a wide shower. So you're gonna, com you're gonna combine uh, shower head distribution, water flow, and water force. And if you have the right, pat the right uh, figures in each category, you can actually qualify your shower head to the EPA water sense program. So that ensures the consumer that they're getting a good shower head that will rinse the uh, soap out of their uh, hair, but also um, not use too much water. Okay, so um, I just don't want to uh, go over time. So we have a specification for faucets, which is 1.5 gallons per minute. Um, and that was uh, set over the, you know, and that's a, a difference over the 2.2 that's required. Um, it doesn't include metering or public use faucets. So like things that you'd see in public bathrooms, it's only for private use. And in some cases, uh, there are some bar sinks uh, that you can have in your home that also uh, can meet the water sense label. Uh, the test methods for this are pretty much the same as would be found uh, for any other kind of faucet. We did not uh, feel like it needed a special test method for water sense, um, but we do have a minimum flow rate. So they test the faucet at 20 PSI to make sure that even people in say high rise buildings or on wells uh, will still get good uh, flow out of the shower head. And then of course it has to meet the lead free requirements. Um, and then we also have a specification for flushing urinals um, and it also uses the same uh, requirements as in the ASME standard, but it's one gallon per, it's a half gallon, sorry, it's a half gallon per flush. And um, you also have to test the fixtures and the, um, the, the fitting, the shower, the flush valve, the flush valve together, but they don't have to be, they're not labeled as a pair, right? You have a, the label applies to the flush valve and the label applies to the ceramic or plastic part of the toilet separately. And then we just encourage people to, you know, marry those two devices together. The specification does not include waterless or non-water using urinals. That's why it's called the flushing urinal specification. Uh, we just found that those were very different and would require very different test methods. And um, so we just excluded them from the label. Um, but these are, you know, the same ASME requirements um, that are in existence for, um, for, you know, for regular flush volumes, uh, flushing urinals, 
The only thing is we also require that the device not have a, it has a no hold open design. So like if you hold the flush handle down, it can't continue to flush water. And that, um, that it's just difficult to vary the flush volume significantly, right? Like you, we want to make sure that the savings stay there. And um, so those are the two extra requirements. These are all the labeled products we have. So we have a specification for soil moisture sensor, irrigation controllers for this, the bodies in, uh, that hold the spray, that hold the spray sprinkler, uh, their pressure regulating sprinkler bodies. And then we also have a specification for weather-based irrigation controllers. Um, you know, we don't, you know, encourage it, but a lot of states, like I said in the beginning, are interested in having, you know, like having, more efficient products sold in their state than is required by the by the DOE Energy pa Energy Policy Act, and so they, you know, decided to set those their their in-state criteria to the water sense level. Uh, manufacturers support using one level, which is the water sense level, and not having all of these states go off and sort of design their own levels and have all these different kinds of things that they have to meet in different places. So with that, I can answer any questions. I'll stop sharing my screen. I know I have a question, but I was going to see if anybody else has one for Stephanie before I launch in. I have a question. Please. So, uh, in Arizona, we're uh, including our ranch up there. We're working with Tamara here. So we see that Flagstaff or northern part of the state is looking at the 1.28 a lot more than a, the rest of, say, the Phoenix Maricopa area. And so with these guidelines, are they pushing them to be something solid? Because there's still a lot of 1.6 gallon flush toilets going in. Well, you may know that the city of Flagstaff has actually required 1.28 or lower since 2009. Uh, so it's been like 13 years since uh, Flagstaff required that for uh, residential applications. And then I believe commercial uh, went to that in 2011. So we know that people are bringing the 1.6s up from the Phoenix area, um, like contractors, and we've been trying to catch that you know if they're being installed in new construction and then um you know when customers are replacing that's you know one reason why we want to communicate with plumbers is that it is required in our code to go to 1.28 or lower uh currently we don't have anything about the water scent specification in the code unless you're applying for our rebate program and then we do but um that is something that we are discussing for the future um we have like a strategic plan that we passed in 2020. And so looking at code changes to require uh, water sense specifications for some fixtures uh, is on the table. Does that um, answer your question or, or was your question a little bit different? Yeah, well, that, that was a good answer. Uh, we're looking forward to actually seeing the Maricopa area and the southern parts of the state do as well as Flagstaff, who's already had it implemented for a long time. And we abide that by that as well since there's Arizona supply, but it we look forward to selling 1.28 or less on a regular basis, but it seems like there's still a lot of that 1.6 uh, request. Yeah, and I think that's because of the misperceptions that people have about, you know, I think when 1.6s first came out, some of them were not performing well, and I think that Combating that perception is part of our job and, and part of what the water sense label has been doing. Yeah, I think the line carry has, the more that that has been talked about, the better received uh, from what we've uh, been talking to our customers about. Uh, mm. As long as you talk line carry, which not everybody always did, but the more you talk about line carry, then they become more comfortable with these smaller amount of water actually doing what it can do. Yeah, actually that was my question for Stephanie because I I don't really know very much about line carry. Um, is there, what kind of testing specifically is done? 
Because I, you know, we, we saw in the demonstration kind of like the bowl in the capture under the bowl afterwards. But what's done to like ensure that the that the line carry is sufficient? So um, the SME standard always had a waste transport requirement, but it was done with polyethylene balls. And so people felt like that wasn't really sort of mimicking the issue, you know, the, you know, real life very well. So we didn't change that requirement, but, um, you know, there was this, God, he was, he was great. He was this like long-term researcher at the National Institute of Standards and Technology that did a lot of work with plumbing. And he actually sat with our uh, engineers that were helping us develop the WaterSense test method. And they did a test on a number of products before we issued the specification to see if you put 350 grams of waste and uh, four balls of toilet paper in a toilet and put it on a plumbing rig with a sort of drain line that mimicked what was going on in a home, how far would that waste carry down the line? And so the results of that are in the water sense, uh, you know, reports online. But I think generally, uh, I'm not going to quote how many feet it was because I don't remember and I don't want to misspeak, but it was, you know, he felt like it was sufficient to get the waste most of the way out to the drink, to the sewer line into the main and um, and that it was like he sort of gave it his blessing and he's who's his name is Lawrence Galwin and people just sort of consider him the father of like, you know, good plumbing in the United States and he had really helped us in the beginning with that. So, you know, we don't see we felt like that was um you know a very good test for us to do and so we have that data um and so we don't think that there's an issue with it and we don't get a lot of complaints about products um in any form about whether that waste clears the bowl or whether they have clogs going back um you know coming you know and callbacks for plumbers so but I mean, it's good to know that, you know, the plumbing industry, like the people in the field are really interested in that drain line carry. And maybe uh, I'll pull it from the deep recesses of, you know, a government website and make it more prominent so that people can actually see that information and, and like be, you know, reassured by it. Yeah, for sure. Um, does anyone else have a question for Stephanie? I guess I was also curious if you could just briefly mention whether or not there's any plans for review of things like washing machines or dishwashers, or if the Energy Star label is essentially um, standing in for those assessments for those products. Yeah, the Energy Star label has already like developed that label for those products, but we do work with them on the water efficiency criteria for those. Okay. So, um, you know, so we have we, you know, we sort of weigh in and we look at what they're doing over there. And so we work together with them. But um, just because of the way the programs label products, it just is simpler if they're only either they're either Energy Star or Water Sense. And so we just don't. Um, so they weigh in on some of our things that have a high energy component. And, you know, they we talk to them about things that have a big water use that they live on. So. Cool. That's great information. Well, I thought that was really fascinating and I am like going to rewatch that <laughs> presentation today. I just this stuff is is really intriguing to me and I think that we get these kinds of questions a lot. So I just want to really express my sincere gratitude for you covering all of those all of those technical aspects for us. Sure, no problem. Uh, I I mean, it's in the PDF that I sent you, but my contact information and well, the helpline information is there. And if somebody contacts the helpline, then they can get they can ultimately get to me and ask me a question if they have something more specific they want.